Greetings and welcome to the Carroll School webinars. I'm Andy Boynton, Dean of the Carroll School of Management at Boston College. And as you may know, each year we norm normally hold an in-person finance conference on campus that brings together industry leaders, academic researchers, as well as policymakers. This year though, we have pivoted to webinars and in doing so, we've created a valuable series of conversation on urgent topics relevant to a broad range of professionals, specialists and non-specialists alike. The three-part series is called Navigating Financial Turbulence in Challenging Times, and it features prominent experts and thought leaders who will be engaged with each other and the audience on questions from geopolitical issues to retirement savings to financial global markets. Today, we present the first of those conversations, an assessment of the current geopolitical scene. And you're in for a treat. The presenter is my friend and fellow classmate from 1978, alum Nick Burns. Moderating the conversation is another good friend, Dan Holland, class of BC 1979. Dan's a very active participant in the BC community, and he has served most visibly recently as co chair of the annual finance conference for the last several years. Dan is also a leader in the financial industry. And by day, he plies his trade with Goldman Sachs as managing director of wealth, private wealth for New England. This will be a highly informative and engaging conversation. And I hope you'll check out the other conversations in this navigation series this week on Friday and Wednesday. You can learn more by going to our website, bc.edu slash CSOM, C-S-O-M. Enjoy the seminar. Thank you, Andy, for that introduction. And thank you to all the students, faculty, alumni, parents, and friends of Boston College for joining us today for the 15th annual Boston College Finance Conference. We are excited to be with you today. We wish that we we're with you personally, but as Andy pointed out, we're doing this virtually. But I'm excited to hear that there are over 470 participants who have registered for this event. So we've had terrific turnout. We appreciate your enthusiasm. Along with my co-chairs, I've had the pleasure of working with Dean Boynton and his staff on this conference for several years now. A couple of months after the end of each conference, Andy convenes the co-chairs to begin planning for the next event. And we try to suggest topics of interest related to finance and the economy that will be interesting, timely, and relevant in June of the following year, and then go about finding guests to join us for the conference. We could not possibly have predicted the main topics that are dominating our national conversations today. The global pandemic and the economic fallout <clears throat> of temporarily shutting down the world economy, combined with protests across the country to address racial inequality and social justice dominate our thoughts today. We will talk about these topics and many others with one of the world's thought leaders on international affairs, Ambassador Nick Burns. Nick, we appreciate you joining us today. You have been very generous to BC with your time and talent and have headlined our finance conferences in the past. I know that many of our guests are look for, looking forward to hearing your comments this morning. It's always humbling to introduce Nick Burns. I thought I did okay at BC. I majored in economics. I got some decent grades. I served as a Naval officer. I went down to Wharton, got an MBA, and I worked at Goldman Sachs for 33 years. But I always feel like a complete underachiever when I get to introduce Nick Burns. But here goes. Ambassador Nicholas Burns is the Roy and Barbara Goodman Family Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's the founder and faculty chair of the Future of Diplomacy Project, faculty chair of the Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship. He serves on the Board of Directors of the Kennedy School's Belfer Center, is a faculty affiliate of the Middle East Initiative and is a faculty associate at Harvard's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Nick served in the United States government for 27 years in a variety of roles, including Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Lead U.S. Negotiator on Iran's Nuclear Program, U.S. Ambassador for NATO, Ambassador to Greece, and State Department Spokesman. He worked for five years on the National Security Council at the White House, where he was a Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia Affairs, and Special Assistant to President Clinton 
and as a director for Soviet, Affair, Soviet affairs in the administration of President George H.W. Bush. Nick served in the, in the American Consulate General in Jerusalem, we coordinated U.S. economic assistance to the Palestinian people in the West Bank, and before that, at the American embassies in Egypt and Mauritania. He's also a member of the Secretary, he was a member of uh, Secretary of State John Kerry's Foreign Affairs Policy Board. He has a BA in history from Boston College, as Andy mentioned, and a master's in international relations from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And that's his abbreviated biography. I think I can say with confidence that there are very few people in the world as qualified to discuss geopolitics as Ambassador Burns. He's also the parent of two BC alums and is on our board of trustees. So thank you, Nick, we're really delighted. So Nick, I don't think we can begin any conversation about geopolitics, geopolitics and the role of the United States in the world without first looking inward at the events of the last few weeks and the profound impact these events have had on our country and around the world. The protests against racial inequality have found support in Europe, South America, and elsewhere. In the United States, we've always held ourselves out as an example to the world of what a free democratic society should be. And we have some very serious social, social issues to address. The tragic deaths of George Floyd and others brought to the surface issues of racial inequality and social justice that have been a problem in our society for a long, long time. So how do the divisions in our country around race relations impact our reputation in the world? And how do we demonstrate the necessary leadership to show the world that we're in fact the best example of a Western style democracy? Well, Dan, thank you and, and, and good morning and thank you very much for that extraordinarily kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you. We were just one year apart at BC and we still retain a, a love uh, for our, our alma mater. And I want to thank our mutual friend, uh, Dean Andy Boynton. Dandy and I were actually classmates. I am a great admirer of everything he's done at the School of Management at BC. And so it's great to be with you for the finance conference. And um, we're gonna have a good conversation. I look forward to questions from all, all the people who are listening in as well after you and I have our conversation. Uh, we agreed to start with this issue because we have to talk about race. It's the seminal issue of the moment here in the United States. And in a way it's the seminal issue of American history since the first slave ship arrived at our shores in 1619. Uh, the Harvard historian Jill Lepore in her recent book, These Truths, um, it's a one volume, 800 page history of the United States. She says that race runs through every era, every major event, every big question in American society. Ken Burns, I'm not, no relation, but I'm a great admirer of Ken. Ken said to me once, he said, you know, I, he, I think he'd made at that point 26 or 27 documentary films, he said race, is a major, was a major factor in nearly all of his films, from jazz to the Civil War, to the Second World War, to baseball. And so it's the great defining issue that we've never managed to get right in America. We can see periods of progress, certainly the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts of 1964 and 65, certainly the election of President Obama in 2008. And I think all of us as Americans look at the events of the last two weeks, the murder, and I think that is the right word for it, of George Floyd, this, this unbelievable wave of protests. The New York Times said yesterday, this may be the most expansive set of protests in recent American history. You can feel the passion on the streets. Fortunately, most of the, most of the people out in the streets are peaceful, the demonstrators exercising their First Amendment rights. But I think what they're telling us is, America hasn't healed itself. America's still ill. We have this terrible crisis of race. African Americans are not treated the way white Americans like you and I are treated. Our kids are not being summarily picked up on the streets and having violent violence in some instances inflicted upon them as would happen with George Floyd. And so we've, we've got to make this right. And every one of us has to do what we can individually. That's what Condoleezza Rice has been saying in her recent op-ed last week and over the weekend on Face the Nation that we each have to act individually. Every institution has to act. It's in interesting to see so many CEOs speak up on behalf of corporate America to affirm their focus uh, 
in their commitment to racial diversity and, and racial justice. And I think to hear some of the conservative voices in America say the same thing from Mitch McConnell to George W. Bush to Mitt Romney, I think we're seeing a lot of leadership on the streets. We're seeing a lot of leadership uh, in corporate boardrooms. We need better leadership from the president. I think he's failed us, frankly, on this issue. But it ha we have to get this right. And, and Dan, the last thing I'll say is, it's had a extraordinarily negative impact on the how the rest of the world sees us. Um, as I, I've lived in seven countries in my career, spent a lot of time, well more than a decade and a half overseas in my life. And what people tend to admire most about America is not our military might, it's not our space programs in the past, it's the First Amendment, it's the Bill of Rights, it's our immigrant society, it's the fact that we have a self-corrective part of our national DNA that allows us to admit our mistakes and try to do something about them. And we've taken a major hit in our credibility um, over the last couple of weeks. And you can, you can certainly see that in the demonstrations all over the world. Our daughter Caroline's a BC grad. She lives and works for a private company in Berlin. And she participated uh, in, in the big demonstration in Berlin for racial justice at Alexanderplatz. And there were thousands of young people out there over the weekend. So um, I think we just all have to recommit ourselves uh, to, um, to do the right thing and to make sure that we can create a society that's truly uh, inclusive for everybody, most especially for African-Americans. Thank you, Nick. That's uh, incredibly well said. And there's just so much work to be done on that front. And it's going to be an issue that's going to be with us for a long time. Um, Shifting gears a little bit, uh, the world economy has been devastated by a global pandemic. It's both a healthcare crisis and an economic crisis. Um, central banks around the world have responded with monetary st stimulus and various programs to mitigate the economic impact. And governments have initiated various fiscal policies as well. So how would you evaluate the global response, both economically and politically so far? I, th I think it's actually been lackluster, especially um, on the pandemic. But I, I would say this, I mean, to give our leaders a break, it made sense, that especially here in the East Coast of the United States, when we were hit really hard, and when New York was hit really hard, and Michigan, and Boston, New Jersey, it made sense that we would all turn inward and focus on our local hospitals, our states, and that the President would, and the Congress would really want to give um, our our first responders, our doctors, our nurses, our great hospital staffs, all the support they needed. And you saw that every country did that. China did that back in January and February. South Korea and Japan did that. The Europeans did it. So it makes sense that the big front uh, on, on the pandemic had to be the home front. But there's also a global dimension. And it's not just, it's not just charity, although charity is important, but it's self-interest. We also have to think globally about what the world can do, for instance, cooperation and finding a vaccine. Uh, cooperation in deciding once a vaccine is found, if one is found, how to distribute it equi equitably among 7.7 .7 billion people, the theoretically the, the world's population. How do we share data on infection and death rates so that epidemiologists can model the pandemic in a, in a better way than we've been able to do, given for, for instance, how, how close the Chinese have been to sharing information. So there's a big international dimension out there. And I just assumed when we all went uh, and, and retreated to our homes and practiced social distancing back in the early part of March, I assumed that President Trump, President Xi Jinping, Angela Merkel would be working together and it never happened. It didn't happen because you've seen the Chinese and Americans use this conflict, the pandemic, to compete with each other. Who did a better job? Who's been more responsible? There's been a war of words between our government and the Chinese government. It, it didn't happen because they didn't go to the right institution that could have provided, Dan, I think, the leadership, the G20, the 20 largest economies in the world. If you remember back in 2008 and nine, when we were hit hard by the Great Recession, George W. Bush and then Barack Obama, when he came into office in early 09, they turned to the G20 and they, and they worked very closely with the other major economies to align our fiscal and monetary policies so that they might have avoid a Great Depression, which they did, we did back in 2008, nine. We've not seen that now on the pandemic. And, we, and apart from the central bankers, we haven't seen it on the global 
uh, the huge recession, the severe recession that we're in. I, I think the heroes, if you're looking for heroes on the, on the economic side, are the central bankers. Jay Powell consistently in my conversations with foreign leaders gets the highest marks of any American for having worked so effectively with Christine Lagarde at the European Central Bank, with the Canadian, British, and Japanese central banks, even with the Chinese central bank, which of course he has to do, given China's place in the global economy. But you've not seen that from presidents and prime ministers, from finance ministers, our treasury secretary, that real focus on working globally, because that's on our interest to do. And I think we can do a lot better on the economic and the pandemic fronts. We have to act locally first, but we also have to think globally. You, you have to do both uh, to be effective. So with any of these challenges, the turbulence and instability that comes with it can also create opportunities. And what opportunities of similar scale of the challenges brought on by COVID do you potentially see in the geopolitical dimension? What, what, what positives might come out of all this? I, I hear your comments that we haven't done everything we could have so far, but what do you see as far as, as hopeful comments? Well, I think just as I think that business leaders, I know we have a lot of business people um, with us today and, and, and government leaders do best when they're adaptive, when they're self-confident enough to recognize where we failed. And then we, we learn from our mistakes and we retool and we form teams and coalitions and we push forward and try to do it better the next time, better the next time. I'm sure that's your reality at Goldman Sachs. That was my reality in the federal government. I remember one of the people I worked with really closely in government on several occasions was Condoleezza Rice. I'm a great admirer of Condi. And I always marveled at her self-confidence and, and humility as a leader. She would sometimes say to us, you know, get the smartest people in, in the State Department together Friday afternoon, my office, two o'clock, and have them tear apart my policy on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I wanna hear the critique of what we're doing. I wanna know if I'm missing an opportunity. And I marveled at that because that's true leadership. And I think, Dan, that's the answer to your question. We've got to do that now. We clearly, as a globe, did not react fast enough or in a coordinated way uh, to meet the pandemic back in January, February, March, April, as it rolled through the world. And it's, of course, still roiling many of our states and Brazil and India and where there's a real crisis. We've got to learn the lessons, and I think that's probably, it's hard to say it's a silver lining when there's been so much death and suffering, but it's what we must do now to do better the next time. Recognize our management and leadership analytical deficiencies. We didn't look around corners. We weren't imaginative enough to see that an outbreak in late December in Wuhan would lead to a global pandemic, the likes of which none of us have ever experienced, a shutdown of life as we know it, major hit on the economy and the livelihoods and prosperity of a lot of people. And now we have a situation, Dan, where I was reading in the New York Times uh, yesterday, after these extraordinary advances in alleviating poverty, more than over the last 40 years, more than a billion people lift, lifted out of poverty, economists might now think that because of the pandemic, and the global economic crisis, all sorts of people who'd reached the middle class in places like China and India, and Nigeria and Brazil are gonna unfortunately lose that status, you know, enter the ranks of the poor again, and you're seeing food shortages in major cities. So I think it's not a very positive way of answering your very good question. If you recognize where the failings are, then you recommit yourself to relearn, to be better and do better the next time I think that's the opportunity uh, that comes to us because we're still in the middle of both of these crises, the pandemic and the economic crisis. Is the World Health Organization the right body to lead the world in this pandemic? Are there changes that need to be made to the WHO? Are there other organizations that might be more effective? I think that's the right question to ask maybe a year from now or a year and a half from now, whenever there's a vaccine and the pandemic is in the global past. Uh, that's the right question to ask because the World Health Organization didn't perform admirably, especially back in the critical weeks of January when it really didn't ask tough questions of China. It went along with China's 
um, failure to be transparent with the rest of the world and honest with the rest of the world about the dimensions of the pandemic. And, and that set us all back. It made us all too complacent about whether or not the pandemic right, might reach our shores in places like Europe or, or North America. So I do think since we're a major shareholder, we have been, and a major funder of the World Health Organization, it's incumbent upon us working with others to take stock because there'll be pandemics in our future. We're gonna need a World Health Organization or a replacement organization to deal with the certainty of pandemics. If you think of the last 17 years, we've had SARS 2003, H1N1 2009, Ebola 2014, now coronavirus 2020, the probability is very high that some type of pandemic will hit us. We've got to do better as a global community. But I would have that conversation once the current pandemic pandemic has passed, because there's another question. What is the organization that can best unite us today and tomorrow and next week? It's the World Health Organization. It is a central clearinghouse for um, epidemiologists, for global health information, for best advice. And also, it's the central funder itself for public health in many of the poorest countries in the world. So I actually think it was a grave tactical era, and I would even say an ethical era by President Trump, just to pull us out 10 days ago. We're not gonna play anymore. We're drawing our funding. We're not gonna come to the meetings in the middle of the pandemic. It's like, it's like deciding to defund the fire department in the middle of a major fire you might want to reform the fire department if it hasn't performed, but you don't do it when the fire is raging. And I think that's the mistake the president's made. And so whether it's the World Health Organization two or three years from now, or some replacement organization, or a dramatically reformed World Health Organization, I'm with that, but I'm not with pulling the plug on funding in the middle of a crisis. I think that's frankly not right. It's not morally correct. It's not smart because we need this clearinghouse right now. Just, um, you referenced China a few times, and just sticking with China for a moment, there's lots of topics to discuss about China. Sure are. Yeah. They're a regional hegemon with ambitions to become more than that. As their economy continues to grow, they have concurrently expanded their military capabilities as well as their political influence around the world. They have a leader for life and a 50-year plan. In the U.S., we have elections every four years and change administrations every four years or eight years. And we have some... Um, some have suggested that our strategy for addressing the challenges from China are inadequate. The strategy is inadequate. While we may have a military strategy, we lack a national strategy. And whether it's trade agreements, intellectual uh, property transfer, global supply chain management, sourcing PPE for you know, the next pandemic if it occurs, cyber warfare, um, there are just lots of challenges. And we're going to have to deal with China as a major global competitor, an important partner for many years, um, particularly around global trade. And so how do you think our strategy should evolve over the coming years to address some of these competitive dynamics with China? Well, Dan, first of all, I think you're absolutely right to ask this question. This is the central question for the United States and for most of the world going forward. Can we learn to live with China and work with it when that's possible, but not be dominated by China? and not be taken advantage of by the Chinese government, which is happening to a lot of American businesses. I would liken it to when you and I and Andy Boynton were young guys at BC in the late 1970s. The biggest challenge geopolitically of that time was the Cold War and the Soviet Union. We didn't realize we were about a decade away from the end of the Soviet Union when you and I were graduating from BC. The biggest challenge for Americans, especially for our kids, our grandchildren, this is gonna be well into the future, is gonna be China. How do we compete with China? But how do we also balance that time to time with cooperating with China? And it's interesting in the United States these days, this is not a partisan issue in Washington, it's not. Most Democrats agree with, they won't, probably won't say this publicly, but agree with a lot of what President uh, Trump's been doing on China. Most Republicans, would agree with what President Obama had done in the last, his last years of office on China. We're facing the major challenger to American leadership in the world in China. It's the second largest economy. And so we're competing for economic dominance, if you will. Uh, we're competing certainly on trade where China has been ripping off the intellectual property, which is 
the lifeblood of the American economy and the tech world. Um, and they've not been playing by the rules fairly. We're competing there. We're competing for military predominance or military power, if you will, in the Indo-Pacific with the US and its allies. Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand have been dominant over the last 75 years since the end of the Second World War. China is pushing out, challenging the United States and its allies. They don't wanna create a war and we don't wanna fight them, but they're trying to push us away uh, from the South and East China Seas and the Western Pacific, push us far out into the Pacific. They're challenging us there. They're certainly challenging us ideologically, which is interesting to see. You see the self-confidence in Xi Jinping at the party meeting 10 days ago in Beijing. He asserted that authoritarianism is the way forward for the rest of the world, not just for China. He says, look at, look at the way that China's protected he said, our, our people during the pandemic, and look at the failings of the United States and the United Kingdom with our high infection rights and high, high number of deaths. So we're competing there too. And I think the challenge for us is we have to compete with China in all those realms. We don't wanna just shrink away from our global leadership positions or not protect our businesses or not protect the democracies throughout uh, the Pacific Rim. But on the other hand, we also have to cooperate at times with China. We can't resolve the, the, the current global economic crisis without the set number two economy in the world, China. We can't do anything on the pandemic, frankly, globally, without cooperating with China. And on climate change, and I know we'll talk about that a little later on in the conversation, the United States and China are the one and two carbon emitters. If anything's gonna be done to arrest climate change, we have to work together. So I think a lot of people would say, sensible leaders in Washington would say, we have to compete and we have to cooperate. And you have to hold those two in some kind of uneasy balance. That's why we need sophisticated, really smart people at the top of our government at the top, and in the CEO boardrooms in the United States to, to handle this kind of dichotomy. It's hard to do. And unfortunately, I, I think among many Democrats, as well as Republicans, there's a demonization of China underway. China's kind of being reincarnated as the great enemy of the United States. And I worry about that because I want to compete too and be tough-minded when we have to be. But there has to be this collaboration with the Chinese too. We can't decouple. The, I mean, you know this better than I working uh, in the industry you're in, Dan. We can't decouple the American economy from China. China you know, it's, it's interesting to look at the economic tables these days. Nearly every major economy in the world has China as its leading trade partner. And so, you know, the idea that somehow we create two economic blocks in the world, that takes us back several centuries in economic history. That would be a huge threat to global economic stability and, 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 and economic prosperity, of which there's been a lot until recent months. So that's how I, I view this. Um, there's a lot of conversation. There will be in our political campaign in November, a lot of conversation throughout the United States on how to handle this. And that's my best answer as to how, what we should do in approaching China. Thank you. Nick, I know you've uh, written extensively about the importance of alliances. And you were ambassador to NATO and clearly understand the importance of that relationship. On Saturday, we reflected on the 76th anniversary of D-Day. And some have suggested that we are drifting away from some of our most important allies. And this pandemic hasn't helped as many countries look inward, restrict their borders, et cetera. Can you comment on the state of our regional alliances today and how you see that evolving? Yeah, thank you for asking about this, Dan. This does go to the heart of part of what I did in my career, which is to serve at NATO and, and to think about creating and sustaining our great alliances and coalitions. I would say this, Dan, about alliances. Why would the United States wanna be alone in the world? In a highly globalized, highly integrated world, we've never had such integration in the world before. And, and the idea that somehow we'd wanna to retreat to our, the 50 states and dig a moat around the country and pull up the drawbridges, it makes no sense. It might've made sense in 1720, certainly 1820, not 2020, not the way the world is structured economically, not the way that we're so susceptible, think of, think of the virus, uh, to, um, to, in this case, a pan, an illness, an epidemic in China became a global pandemic. So we gotta think globally. And the difference maker 
on behalf of the United States is that our alliances, NATO in the North Atlantic sphere, our East Asian alliances with Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, Thailand, uh, they, they are a multiplier of American, of American power in the world. And we have alliances, the Chinese and Russians do not. And that is the most important power differential between the US and Putin and the US and Xi Jinping. We're ultimately a stronger power because we can call on all these countries to help us. They help us pay the military bills. Their soldiers help us do the fighting. They take a lot of risk with us. I was ambassador to NATO, as you mentioned, on 9-11. And when we were hit really hard, and I, I know a lot of New Yorkers probably on this call remember that day, 3,000 people dead in New York City and Northern New Jersey, uh, Westchester County, people all around that metropolitan area suffered that day. Washington, D.C., when the Pentagon was hit. I couldn't reach, I was in Brussels, Belgium at NATO headquarters with my mission. I couldn't reach the Pentagon and the State Department and White House in the four or five hours after the attacks because they'd been evacuated. We were expecting that last attack into Washington, D.C. It could have been Flight 93. We'll never know for sure. And um, then my phone started to ring, and it wasn't from Washington. It was calls from my NATO colleagues, the German ambassador, the French ambassador, the Polish ambassador, the Canadian ambassador actually called first. And they all said the same thing. We want to help. We want to be with you. And by the next morning, we had invoked for the first time in NATO history, um, Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which essentially says, if one of us is attacked, we shall consider it that all of us have been attacked. We had never had to invoke it in NATO history because that Soviet attack never came in the Cold War. It came through 21 young men, Al-Qaeda terrorists, who attacked our major city, the hub of the American economy in New York. And then they attacked the Pentagon, the seat of our government in Washington, D.C. And we weren't alone on 9-11. And when we invoked Article 5, all those NATO allies went into Afghanistan with us. And the great majority are still there nearly 20 years later. Most of them went into Iraq with us eventually after arguing about it in 2003, they still went with us. So that kind of support, that kind of fraternal obligation to each other is an enormous strength of the United States. And I, I'm sorry to say, um, and I'm going to be transparent. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a supporter of President Trump. You may have guessed that already. And I'm uh, actually an advisor uh, to Joe Biden uh, on his campaign. But I think President Trump has failed us on alliances. He has disregarded NATO. He's been the weakest leader we've ever had at NATO. He, has, he argues more with Angela Merkel uh, and Emmanuel Macron in public than he does with Putin. And the NATO allies are deflated by the lack of American support for the alliance. And he's doing the same thing in Japan and in South Korea with our East Asian alliance. So this has to be corrected. The United States does not want to be alone in the world. And I think it's one of the key changes that needs to be made. If President Trump is reelected, I would hope he'd reflect on this and decide to strengthen the alliances. If Joe Biden comes in, I know what he'll do. He will go back to full, a full embrace. And that's a of NATO. That's a bipartisan tradition. And the only silver lining I can see here, Dan, is that in recent public opinion polls, over 70% of the American people, Republicans and Democrats, say they support NATO. And I testify before Congress, I have many times in the last four or five years, senior Republicans in the Senate and House have not stopped supporting NATO. It really is just the president who's taken this bizarre position that somehow we should be unilateralists and not rely upon our allies and friends around the world. Nick, the U.S. has had a special relationship with the United Kingdom since our founding as a nation. And you had mentioned in one of our earlier conversations that the U.K. is the single largest investor in the United States. As we look towards building a new trade agreement with the U.K. post-Brexit, um, how do you think our relationship with the United Kingdom evolves? Well, thank you for asking this. I mean, there is still a special relationship. There was a famous wartime special relationship between Winston Churchill and FDR. And by the way, I'm, I'm reading an incredibly good book by Eric Larson called The Splendid and the Vile. I think it's two or three in the New York Times hardcover nonfiction list. It really is about what happened to Britain during the Battle of Britain, during this merciless German aerial bombardment of British cities 
um, in the summer uh, and winter of 1940, at the beginning of the Second World War, and Churchill's heroic leadership in inspiring Britain to resist Hitler. And so I recommend that book, but that book has made me think anew about the durability of this relationship. It's the most important relationship we've ever had with any country in American history, I think, in a way, even more important than with Canada and Mexico, who are fraternal uh, brothers and sisters of the United States, because we came from Britain. We emerged from the British Empire. We seceded. We fought a war of revolution. And yet our common law system, our legal system, our political system is very much derived from British common law and Britain's parliamentary democracy. Um, so much of the history of where I come from, and at least where, where I grew up in New England, uh, is, is really the history of England's presence here. And so we have to pay tribute to that. It's still with us. And Britain's in an entirely different place now. It's left the EU. It's still in NATO, so we can work with the British in NATO. Um, but the earliest signal of this new recreating the British-American relationship will be in this trade agreement. And you said it right. Britain is the largest investor into the American economy. It is a critical economic and commercial partner. It's in many ways still our number one military partner, certainly in the NATO alliance, the strongest military partner we have is with Britain, partnership with Britain. So we need to get this right. I think President Trump has been right to say, let me say something good about him, that this new trade agreement should be a priority and he may not get it done before the election. If he's reelected, I think he'll make it a priority. If Vice President Biden is elected, I would think it would be an early priority that we would want to have a free trade agreement between two leading democracies. And I think in a way, it was a mistake in my view for Britain to leave the EU. I think it hurts Britain and it hurts the EU. But in a way now that Britain has made its decision, it's out, we can recreate a new US-UK relationship for the 21st century. You've had a 400 year relationship, if you think of it that way, since the pilgrims came. Uh, and we can, we can create it, and that's an exciting proposition. I'm involved in an organization called American Ditchley. It's a British American strategy group. And we're gonna have a whole conference on this just to try to rethink the future of this relationship. So thank you for that good question. You, you spent a good part of your career dealing with the issues in Ireland. And yeah. many of us at Boston College have a particular interest in Irish affairs. So how does Brexit impact Ireland and, and what do you see happening there? Well, I think that Brexit's gonna have a major impact on Ireland, Dan, and you're right. I mean, BC's most important center overseas is the Boston College Center in Dublin. BC, I think, has a greater presence in Ireland than any other American university. We were formed in 1863, essentially to educate the first generation of Irish and Italian immigrants who came to the United States in the mid 19th century. I'm a very typical BC grad. I have two Irish uh, immigrant grandparents who came here as teenagers, uneducated, sons and daughters of both of them are farmers. And yet you see the, mir the miracle of so many BC families where it, a lot of people are the first generation to go to college in their family, it's BC. So I think that um, that we at BC, who are affiliated with BC, should have a special continuing interest. And I think there is, a, there is an opportunity, there's a possibility that Brexit might lead, unfortunately, to the breakup of the United Kingdom. A lot of Brits are telling me that they think the Scots will likely have a referendum at some point in the next four or five years to secede a second referendum following the one that failed in 2014. And the Scots are very, five million Scots, very pro-EU. You could see a possibility that the people of Scotland could vote to secede. And Ireland's even more intriguing because the Catholic population rate in Northern Ireland uh, is much higher, the growth rate in the population is much higher than among uh, the Protestants in Northern Ireland. The Catholics will soon outnumber for the first time in centuries the Protestants in Northern Ireland, and the people of Northern Ireland, both Catholic and Protestant, also voted to stay in the European Union during the Brexit vote of 2016. So a lot of my British friends are saying there is a real possibility, not a certainty, that at some point in the next decade or two, Ireland will become one nation governed from Dublin, one unified state on the Ireland, something on the island, something Ireland has never been before because of British rule and colonialism.
And that is an extraordinary thing to talk about. I would never, Dan, have said at any time until the last couple of years that the land of my, on both sides of my family, of my ancestors would become a united, um, a united country after so many, six, 700 years of subjugation, colonialism, division, British imperialism, the troubles. You wanna read another, another great book. It's Patrick Radden Keefe's Say Nothing. He won the Pulitzer Prize. It's his chronicle of the troubles in Northern Ireland uh, between Catholics and Protestants just in the last 30 years. So you've asked the right question. It's extraordinary to think about this possibility of United Ireland. We've had a couple of questions about Europe. So sticking with Europe and specifically the European Union, which you've referenced, uh, what risks do you see as they look to rebuild their economies coming out of the economic crisis? As some of the southern countries face different challenges than their northern neighbors? I think there are real, real challenges for the future of the European Union, but I'm not one of those people who's predicting the end of the European Union or every country seceding and going back to a Europe of nation states. The EU is widely accepted. Uh, as a positive development, a positive institution by the great majority of Europeans. It has its detractors. A lot of the right-wing populists, Marine Le Pen in France, um, Geert Wilders in the Netherlands, Alternative for Deutschland, the number three political party now in the United Kingdom, in uh, Germany, excuse me, they're anti-EU. But if you look at the public opinion polls, there's not a widespread movement, movement for countries to secede from the EU. But nonetheless, it's at a critical time. On the economic crisis, I think the real lesson for the European Union is they have a monetary union, and yet there's no fiscal union, uh, and there's no banking union. And so structurally, there are a lot, I think now, the way the United States was in the 1780s and 1790s, you have to recreate institutions to bind uh, the elementary parts of your, of your state together. The EU has to move towards a fiscal union. So they have that fiscal stability and accountability to go along with the euro. And a big issue, as you know, for the last several decades has been, will the wealthier Northern European countries, Finland, Sweden, Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, agree to, in effect, in a crisis, help the poorer countries to the South, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and, and Greece. And for the first time in decades now, there is a decision by Macron and Merkel, the two most important leaders, that they'll agree to um, this Eurobond solution whereby um, the poorer countries will be able to, to take, a, um, take part in a European credit facility and bond facility that will tide them over and help them with their fiscal imbalances over the next couple of, uh, of years. That has to be ratified by the parliaments of every single European Union member. And uh, that's not a done deal, but the fact that Merkel and Macron came together, I think is highly significant. It means that they're rededicating themselves to the stability, financial stability in the EU itself. The other, that's, that, those are the big challenges. The other challenge is they just have a new head of the European Central Bank, but the early reports are that Christine Lagarde has been a very competent, uh, and strong leader during the first months of the economic crisis. So I actually think the Europeans will likely be able to surmount this crisis with a lot of difficulty the way we'll have a lot of difficulty as well. When you think about the amount of debt that's been issued um, really all over the world, in the United States, Europe, Japan, everywhere, um, and it's just the amount of leverage that's in the system. Is that a, a risk for the, for the European Union? Is it a risk for the global economy at large? And, and how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I try to, I'm not an economist, obviously. I try to read as many smart economists, left, right, and center as I can. This is, I, I wonder if this is actually unknowable right now. We've, we're entering into a period of national debt and of budget deficits that we haven't seen in, more than well more than half a century i think you'd have to go back to the second world war to see a level of indebtedness for many countries um, who had to spend obviously to succeed in the war survive in the war i know for the united states um, what's already been done in these um, in these rescue packages that the senate has passed by bar bipartisan votes over the last couple of months it's absolutely historic. We've never done anything like this. The position that the federal government has taken 
the debt long term that the federal government will assume it, it, it dwarfs anything we did during the Great Recession of 10, 12 years ago and anything we did during the Great Depression of the 1930s. And so you've got to hope that there's enough growth capacity, as I assume there will be in our economy, enough prosperity generated, enough economic activity to be able to um, handle a long-term debt over the next 20 to 30 to 40 years. The budget deficit situation is really perilous. Before the pandemic hit us, so let's say March 1st, uh, 2020, before we realized what it was going to be, we were looking at the highest budget deficit, the greatest budget deficit in American history, over a trillion dollar U.S. government budget deficit. If, you, if we, the Congress did nothing else in terms of no further relief efforts, and I don't think that'll be the case, I think Congress is going to have to do something else, given the level of poverty in the country and business failure, we are right now at about 3.7 to 3.8 trillion dollar U.S. government budget deficit. What that tells me is that I'm just predicting a President Trump second term or a Democratic uh, administration, you're going to see massive budget cuts. I think massive pressure on the Defense Department, on the State Department, every other agency of the government. Personally, I'm just speaking for myself here, um, we're going to have to think about um, reforming uh, entitlement system. We're going to have to think about tax, how we tax, going back to a progressive tax system. This is just my personal view. I don't see how you escape that with budget deficits of the order of magnitude that we're seeing, we're going to see in the United States. And what it really means is that our generation, you, you and I, Dan, we, we're going to pass off to our kids. And I, I think even our grandchildren, massive fiscal imbalances that they're going to have to balance at some point in the future. That's going to be the price uh, of dealing with a pandemic. And I'm not arguing that the Congress did the wrong thing. I think President Trump and the Congress was right to engage in this massive bailout to help businesses survive and to help people survive um, through the shutdown. Well, we'll leave it to Mark Sider and the markets panel to- uh, We should. The, they're more yeah. capable than I am of thinking through this. That's just one citizen's view. Um, shifting to oil and energy. And it's hard to discuss geopolitics without discussing energy markets as they're global commodities and used to drive economies around the world. Um, we saw unprecedented volatility in the oil markets as Saudi Arabia and Russia decided to increase supply just as the global pandemic was shutting down demand around the world. And we quickly went to a very oversupplied market. And in fact, the value of the front contract in the oil futures market went negative in April, uh, coming into the settlement because it just wasn't enough storage capacity. So oil's back towards $40 per barrel today. And OPEC met virtually over the weekend and agreed to maintain supply cuts for the next month. So without trying to forecast price movements, because I think that's really, really challenging, what are the implications of $40 oil for Russia, Saudi Arabia, and other emerging economies? Yeah, it's, it's forecasting the future of the global energy picture is certainly beyond my personal capacity, although I have a, a really close friend of mine at Harvard uh, is Professor Megan O'Sullivan, and she wrote a really fine book, Windfall, on the new American uh, oil um, uh, oil power, if you will, oil and gas power. And I think, uh, Dan, I'd start there. Obviously, we're seeing tremendous pressure on, on those who've, who've done so well to, uh, in, in fracking, pressure on our natural gas and oil producers here in the United States. We have become, and it's amazing to think of, another big change since we were at BC in the late 1970s. We were an oil importing nation. I remember the gas lines of 1973 when I was a teenager waiting in line for an hour to get gas as the price, I think, quadrupled in the autumn of 1973 in the wake of the Arab-Israeli war. We're in a different place now. The United States is the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. And more broadly, if you look at North America, and I think we really ought to see ourselves in many ways as North American. We have a symbiotic economy with Mexico and Canada. Our three countries are by far the greatest uh, energy producing part of the planet. That's a real source of strength for us. So we're gonna see, we're seeing real pressure on parts of the American uh, energy industry, on producers, because of low prices. We're seeing a lot of pressure on Saudi Arabia. The Saudis price oil probably half of what the Russians price. The Saudis might price, uh, price oil somewhere in the 20s or 30s. 
if you believe their figures. But um, all those dreams that Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, had for new cities and multi-billion dollar investments, a lot of those have been put on hold over the last couple of months in Saudi Arabia. So they've been profoundly affected in what they think they can do to modernize their economy. I think Russia is going to be hardest hit because Russia relies on the export of oil and gas for 50% uh, of its export revenues, total export revenues. I think that sector is almost half of Russian, global, uh, of Russian GDP itself. And the Russians press, price gas way up in the 70s and 80s. So if, if oil is going to be at 40 or anywhere close to, somewhere close to that, the Russians are going to be hemorrhaging funds. Now, they do have this massive, um, I think, half a trillion dollar fund that they've built up over the last 20 years under Putin's leadership. They'll draw that down quickly if oil prices stay down. So I think you're probably going to see the greatest impact on a country like Russia. Some of the other oil producers and gas producers, Iran, Iraq, Angola, Mozambique, are going to be hit hard. Venezuela, which is in a state of societal social meltdown and economic crisis, obviously has huge reserves but can't produce as efficiently as they should. So if you ask the question, who's going to be hurt? Lots of countries in every continent in the world. But I'd say that of the, of the most significant powers in the world, Russia is going to be worst off. And that's why we saw over the weekend that the 23 members of OPEC and the Russia group aligned with OPEC agreed to continue the production cuts for another couple of months because they want to try to boost the price as much as they can. And that's a significant move over the weekend. Just staying with the energy theme a little bit, um, as a professor at Harvard Kennedy School, you interact with students every day. And when you joined us for dinner uh, a few months ago with the Boston chapter of the Business Executives for National Security, you said that climate change was viewed as an existential threat by a majority of your students. Do you think that environmental justice remains front of mind for them today? And then what are the geopolitical implications of, of climate change? Well, I think there's no question for, for that generation. I, my wife and I have, um, have two daughters in their 30s and one is about to turn 30 to BC grads. And uh, I think for them, if you ask them, they're passionate about climate change. My students are. I think that generation has looks at climate change as an existential threat to their future, and they should. Um, you know, as graduates of BC, we were taught by the Jesuits to be uh, fact-based, to believe in uh, empirical thought, uh, to believe in data, uh, and to believe uh, in uh, certainly uh, the Enlightenment. And so, therefore, we can't deny climate change the way too many politicians in the United States deny it. Uh, and we've got to rejoin the Paris Agreement, which we're the only country in the world not part of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the only country not in it. We're the second largest carbon emitter. And we're going to have to look at, in the long term, how do we make changes to our economy that are sensible for the economy, that don't lead to an implosion of the economy, and yet reconfigure the economy uh, for, to be, I think, by mid-century, non-carbon, essentially. And you look at the rapid increase in investments in wind and solar energy in the United States, not just in China or in India or, or Germany. And you look at um, the share that the renewables have uh, in our energy grid that they didn't have 10 or 15 years ago. There's some hope that we can do this. We need the right kind of leadership to do it. But my, that generation that I teach, the generation of my daughters, is absolutely impassioned by this, as they are by racial justice. And we've seen that as they've taken to the streets, almost all of them peacefully over the last two weeks. Nick, you've served your entire career in the State Department and know better than anyone the value of diplomacy. When you speak with your former colleagues, what's on their mind as it relates to the State Department as an organization? I think there's a recognition that we're on, we're on the verge of some major changes, generational changes, uh, as we think about world global economics, power around the world, and the balance of power. China's getting stronger. Uh, I think, fortunately, the United States is still, if you look at total power, military, political, economic, soft power, still stronger than China, still more influential. But China's gaining on us. India's gaining on us. The United States, in a relative sense, growing weaker. And this was inevitable. But as other gained, 
uh, gain positions of power, we would uh, have to give up some of the enormous power that we wielded in the, in the immediate decades after the Second World War. And I think, Dan, that brings us to an insight that we have to have, and that is, and I'm a big defender of the military myself, we need the military as the ultimate defense of the country, and sometimes we need to use the military to protect our country, as we did after 9-11. Right, and, and we did the right thing, I think, in going into Afghanistan after Al-Qaeda. But more often than not, because of these big changes in the world, we're gonna have to lead by diplomacy in the future. Certainly on climate change, on global economic negotiations, on trade negotiations, on all these big transnational issues, like how do you organize the world uh, for a pandemic? Those are diplomatic questions. Those are questions where we create alliances, we create coalitions, we're gonna to have to compromise with the Chinese and make difficult choices. And it means that the State Department needs to be stronger. We need to beef up our diplomatic core at a time when President Trump has tried to cut the State Department budget by one third uh, last year. Uh, he has fired some of our senior uh, career diplomats. And, and these people have, and this is me and my former self, always nonpartisan while you're in government. You don't choose to be Republican or Democrat. You serve both, both parties. But he's been entirely partisan about it. There's been an exodus of officers at every level. Morale is sunk uh, to a low, and we're not spending enough to, um, to be able to field a first-class diplomatic corps in 280 embassies and consulates around the world. The Chinese now, for the first time ever, have more Chinese diplomats in their embassies and consulates than we do, American diplomats. And that has me worried that Chinese have launched a major charm offensive. They have the Belt Road Initiative. Belt Road is the biggest idea in the world today. If you think about it, in 2018 dollars, one of my students worked up these numbers. In 2018 dollars, the Marshall Plan of 1947-54 was about $180 billion. Uh, Belt Road Initiative is already over a trillion dollars. So we need to compete in the world and competing diplomatically is important. And President Trump has been, um, has been no friend of the State Department. He's called it the deep state and he's weakened it. So I've started at Harvard a project and it's a nonpartisan project to think through how could we strengthen the State Department and American diplomacy going forward, no matter who wins in November. And it's, it, we're developing a, a major comprehensive plan. This is three other former ambassadors and myself under Harvard's umbrella to um, lift up the State Department so it can play this role for the American people that we need it to play. Just a rem reminder to the audience, we're gonna open it up for Q&A shortly. I have one more question for Nick. We received a few questions from the audience, so please submit some more and we'll, we'll try to get them to uh, Ambassador Burns. So Nick, you spent a lot of time um, focusing on the issues in the Middle East. You spent a lot of time uh, specifically uh, on issues around Israel. Um, what are the implications of the potential annexation of the West Bank and how do you see that playing out? Well, thank you, Dan. And this is a tough question to end on, but it's an important one. I think every, most everybody knows here that what basically has happened over the last 50 years, Israel uh, has military occupation of the West Bank. And of course, the majority population there are the Palestinians. They have no state. And there are right now about 500,000 Israeli settlers who've set up villages, planned communities, uh, over the last half century in the West Bank. Many of them, well, under international law, all of them illegal. Many of them even illegal in the eyes of the Israeli government. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has publicly threatened to annex all those West Bank settlements that are illegal under international law and make them part of Israel. It's about one third of the territory of the West Bank. This would be a unilateral move that would have no basis in international law it would be a real challenge to how the United States traditionally has thought about this issue. Traditionally, of course, we are a stalwart defender of Israel, as we should be. And yet we've, um, recent American presidents of both parties have said we should, we should recognize a Palestinian state. That state should control uh, the majority of territory, the great majority of territory in the West Bank. This annexation, if it happens, and it, if it happens, it'll happen in the next three or four weeks, it would negate the possibility, I think, of a Palestinian state. And our, our vision has always been a two-state solution, that Israel and the Palestinians would live side by side, that they'd share a, a capital in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem for the Palestinians, West Jerusalem for the Israelis. If Prime Minister Netanyahu goes through with annexation, 
I think it's going to convince a lot of young Palestinians that, may, that, that they shouldn't spend time as their fathers and grandfathers and mothers did on a two-state solution. They should seek a one-state solution, meaning they should try to subvert Israeli, the Jewish state from within, uh, in a one biracial state, by bi ethnic, by religious state, that would essentially threaten the Jewish character of, of Israel, which has been the foundation of the Israeli state since 1948. So this is a very important moment. One of the things I do with the help of a lot of Bostonians is I'm chairman of, a, of the board of an organization called Our Generation Speaks, and we actually help fund joint ventures between young Israelis and young Palestinians, businesses, because we believe one way to create peace and understanding is you build it from the ground up and you build it in a shared enterprise called a business. And um, we have enormous support from Bob Kraft and his son, Dan Kraft, from all sorts of business people in the Boston, New York, Philadelphia region. Uh, we're led by a dynamic young woman, um, Lubna Ibarria, who is a Palestinian, but she's also a fluent speaker of Hebrew and actually has a law degree uh, from an Israeli university. So she's kind of the perfect person to bridge that divide. And um, that's just our minor little effort to try to help the Palestinians and Israelis think about a common future. If, if Netanyahu carries forward in this, he'll just divide those two communities further. Thank you. We're going to uh, go to some of the audience questions now. And uh, we'll start with the first one. Nick, given your experience and perspective, I'm wondering what you think of the rise in power, scope, and influence of large multinational corporations. Are these the inevitable new power structure? Are they incented or even inclined to act benevol benevolently and responsibly? Well, I think it is, it is it's a major development when you see the extraordinary wealth uh, of Apple and Google and Microsoft and Amazon. I mean, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the capitalization of these companies exceeds the G GNP of a score of states globally. They have enormous power economically in the world. They have enormous power um, in terms of how we live our lives, because a lot of people live their lives on Twitter and Facebook. They communicate with each other that way. Uh, they have become the fundamental bedrock uh, of the new digital economy that's going to lead us into the future in biotech and AI, quantum computing. And um, I am someone who's always favored uh, a private sector led economy in the United States. I think maybe on BC, Dan, when I was young and idealistic, I kind of thought maybe I was a socialist when I was 19 or 20. I think church, my dad used to remind me of Churchill's famous maxim he who is not a socialist at age 20 has no heart. He who is a socialist at age 50 has no head. And dad, who was uh, in private business, used to remind me of that. And uh, since I've become a little bit wiser since those early days at BC, uh, I, I think the challenge for us in the United States is to make sure that as we regulate technology companies, we don't kill technology companies. Regulation's coming. It's already being led by uh, the European Union with GDPR and more regulation is coming of the American tech companies and of the Chinese tech companies by the European Union, this massive global regulator that tends to set the table for other countries' regulation. I think it's coming in Washington too, in either a Republican or Democratic administration. I think the challenge is regulate to protect consumers, but do it in an intelligent way so that these companies survive and prosper and continue to innovate because innovation is, as you know very well from your business perspective, it's the key to the American economy. Walter Isaacson, you know, the fame, Walter's written the great biography of Steve Jobs, of um, Benjamin Franklin, of Leonardo. He came to a conference that, that um, we held a year and a half ago on the future of, our, uh, of the digital age, the American economy and the digital age. And he said, what made America great from the Manhattan Project on was the innovation triangle. He said it was the federal government funding R&D uh, programs at universities like Boston College and Caltech and Carnegie Mellon. And then it was the ideas that came out of the universities, engineering, chemistry students, biochem students, that then of course create the great products and services that the American private sector knows best 
how to, how to bring to market and make part of our lives. That's a virtuous triangle. And Walter says it's, that triangle is breaking down. It really produced the great prosperity of the last 75 years in the tech innovations. But when the federal government begins to slash R&D funds, as the federal government has done, particularly under this administration, then you see the triangle break down. And, and I think that's what we've got to be very careful about. How do we promote research and development and keep the triangle intact, private sector government, university research? And then how do we make sure that we regulate to protect people? Because we have to do that, but we do it in an intelligent way. As a non-business person, and a non-tech person, just as a citizen watching all this, that's my hope that we be smart about this. Not that's more um, scalpel as opposed to meat cleaver. I think our innovation economy is our clearest competitive advantage. So we compete against China and elsewhere around the world. So we we have absolutely that. right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and I think it's so exciting to see the Schiller Institute take form uh, at Boston College. That's going to be the, you know, we're, that building is going up in Boston College. That's going to be the center of innovation, of engineering, uh, of biochemistry at Boston College, mainly through the incredible generosity of one of our trustees, Bill Schiller. Here's another question from the audience. Ambassador Burns, what do you believe has contributed to the toxic state of U.S. politics? And do you think the country is truly as divided as the media outlets make it appear? Boy, and you know, okay, I'm going to pledge, Dan, you and I are going to pledge, we're going to end this session whenever we end it uh, on hope. But this is a tough question, and we can't disregard it. Um, I actually think we're as divided, we're more divided now than any other time, probably since 1968. I was 12 that year. That was the year of Martin Luther King's assassination, Robert Kennedy's assassination, riots in the streets, a considerable amount of violence by left-wing groups like the Weathermen, you remember them. Um, and we were torn apart by the Vietnam War in every community. I, don't, I think actually the level of enmity was greater in 1968, as I remember as a kid, than it is now. But I think we are deeply divided, red, blue, urban, rural, north, south. Um, and it is deeply painful for people that We've lost this sense of being American first, that, that's, um, that we, we all can glory in being an American, but we also have obligations to each other. We in Massachusetts have obligations to people in Alabama. Democrats have obligations to Republicans, but if you go on social media, and I'm on Twitter, um, you wouldn't know it by the level of um, outrage and sometimes even hate that you see on social media. And so we need leadership from both political parties. We need it from corporate boardrooms. We need it, we need faith-based leadership. And I think that, let me just say, I think Father Leigh has been a great leader for Boston College at moments like this. Um, I really appreciate his moral clarity. Uh, when he said in the letter to the BC community last week, racism is wrong. And we have to create a, a, a tolerant, inclusive uh, society. And so we need those kind of leaders to step up. Um, he, he is stepping up, but I mean, I mean, we need it in our politicians. We need it in corporate America. We need it on university campuses. Uh, you know, for those of us who teach, we become so blue or so red. Cambridge is about the deepest blue bubble in the United States where my wife and I live. Um, and I teach there. And I've had Republican students, students who tell me they're Republican or conservative, you know, come to me privately saying, I, I feel kind of lonely here at this university. And so you try to create space for them. One of the people who's helped me is, is your colleague at Goldman Sachs, Dean Powell. Uh, Dina uh, has become a fellow in my program and you know, she comes up from New York a couple of times a year. And it's really, I tell my students, look, uh, uh, someone who's a Republican, who's conservative, who served President Trump and President George W. Bush, and I served Bush too, is gonna come into our classroom. You're gonna learn a lot from her. And all of you who think you may not be able to identify with her politically or whatever, you're going to see here's a very smart, here's a very rational, good human being. So connect. And you know what? Students do. And so I think, you know, we at Harvard need to get more Republicans on campus. I would say the same is true probably of universities in red states that don't want to invite Harvard or BC professors or students down. We need that kind of interchange in our society. And, 
my dad, like so many others, 16 million others served in the Second World War in the Marine Corps. And he came out of a very insular Irish American community in Worcester, Massachusetts. He had never been exposed to the multiracial, multi-ethnic America. He said one of the most interesting and valuable experiences of the entire war was working with guys and, and women from all across the country, every race and every creed, and we've lost that. So I think we need to, Connie Rice said it best in her op-ed in the Washington Post last week, and she said it on Face the Nation yesterday. You know, yes, we need the president and the Congress and governors to be leaders, but all of us need to be leaders, all of us individually. And so what can BC do? What can Harvard do? What can you do, Dan? What can I do as an individual? I think that's probably the most important question to ask to achieve a better America and a less fractured America. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but it's, it's the key issue we're dealing with in the country today. Absolutely. Here's one more question from the audience. With substantial threat to democratic governance globally and the rise of autocratic leaders, what are some broad stroke policies that you might recommend for US policy to support and advance democratic principles under a Biden administration? Yeah, and I would say I'll broaden the question. Thank you very much for the question. Under a Biden or Trump administration, what, what should we want to see as Americans? And um, we've talked a lot about, a lot about big tro global trend lines, Dan, you and I, in this conversation. The rise of authoritarian powers and the self-confidence of those powers, Russia, and China, Turkey and Hungary inside the NATO alliance have become authoritarian states. And the relative weakness of the democracies right now, the US and UK suffering economically, suffering in coronavirus, both roiled by our internal disunity that we've just talked about. Um, we're not at a time where Margaret Thatcher, George H.W. Bush, Helmut Kohl could stand up and represent the democratic West as they did so magnificently at the end of the Cold War, those leaders aren't appearing in the West right now. And so I think we who live in democratic society should realize we could lose our democracies if we don't safeguard them at home. And we can certainly be outpointed by the authoritarian states overseas if we don't stand up for democracy. So standing up for the people of Hong Kong is really important right now. Standing up for the people of Taiwan against Chinese imperialism is really important right now. Or the Uyghur population, one million Uyghur, ethnic, uh, ethnic Uyghurs, Muslims in Xinjiang province in Western China have been sent to political re-education camps. In an authoritarian society, you know what that means. These are prisons. Uh, and there's all sorts of intimidation and injustices exacted against the families of these people. We need to stand up for democracy because uh, we certainly know it is the best form of government and the most humane and safeguard our civil liberties. And again, I think that leadership's not coming from the White House. The current president has not stood up for the in beleaguered in, uh, democracies in the world. And, and I hope that if President Trump is reelected, I hope he'll see that he has that opportunity as a leader to do that. If Vice President Biden comes in, you know where I stand on this, I am confident he will make this one of his signature foreign policy objectives to, you know, the United States working with our NATO and East Asian allies, stand up, be proud of what democracies are, safeguard democracies, help people who are living in countries where human rights are being violated. Speaking of safeguarding democracies, the next question relates to um, election interference. How has the threat of election interference from foreign actors evolved since 2016, and how should the U.S. proactively respond to interference and misinformation campaigns? Another great question. There are four countries that have been most aggressive in trying to infiltrate themselves through cyber means into our databases, into Twitter and Facebook, into state electoral commissions. Certainly Russia, the leading actor, but also China and Iran and North Korea. So the first thing we have to do, of course, is raise the cyber defenses and try to use our technological ingenuity and innovation to block them. The second thing we have to do, and frankly, I think this all is fair in love and war, is if, if they're gonna go after us and try to um, subvert our democracy, or even in an extreme case, try to deny people the right to vote freely and fairly, if that happens, and that hasn't happened yet, but that's the threat, 
then we should go after them in some similar way. Uh, because that's the kind of language that Putin and Xi Jinping will understand. I don't mean subvert freedom of thought in Russia and China. I mean, if they're going to make us hurt some way, we certainly have that cyber capacity. We're still the number one cyber power in the world. I think President Trump has been right to invest um, a lot of money in our cyber capacity, in our intelligence community. It's an enormous national asset. And obviously, you don't want to strike out blindly. You want to go to Xi Jinping. As President Obama, I think President Trump have both done, and you want to go to Putin and say, uh, if you don't stop this kind of activity, we know what you're doing. We see what you're doing. There's going to be a price to you. That's the real world. That's how power politics plays out. You do it in such a way that you don't touch off a real war, a hot war, but you do it in such a way that you defend yourself. And I think that both President Trump and President Obama have tried to do this. I do think President Trump would be right to say that this is such a threat that we really ought to be helping the states who run the elections in the United States more than he's been willing to do to strengthen their own cyber defenses. Because we know the FBI told us in this January 2017 report, uh, public report, that the Russians got into the databases of over 20 of our states. We don't want that to happen again. So being able to carry out the election is, of course, a primary uh, obligation of a democracy. We've got to do better at that. A free and fair election. Question on NATO. What do you think of the US troops withdrawn from Germany? What does it mean for US-NATO or maybe even US-Russia relations? Yes, the president announced um, on Friday that we would be withdrawing 9,500 troops, American troops from Germany. I think it's a great mistake by the president. I spoke out uh, in my own way uh, over the weekend against it. I, I would say this, uh, we're not in Germany as charity. We're not in Germany just to help the Germans. We're in Germany to help the United States. The key lesson that we learned from the Second World War, but also from 9-11 is that if we just stay at home, uh, we can't defend America in the modern world. We have to be forward deployed. And that's why President Roosevelt, President Truman, President Eisenhower, every president, Republican and Democrat, have said we need to have troops in Germany, troops in Italy, in order to contain Russian power. And also, they have been our power projection points into the Middle East and into Afghanistan. We deployed into Afghanistan and Iraq, and I was there for both deployments as US ambassador to NATO from these big bases, Ramstein Air Force Base, for instance, uh, in Germany. And we emptied out some of those bases to fight in Iraq and fight in Afghanistan. Now that we're withdrawing down in those bases, in those countries, Iraq and Afghanistan, um, President Obama and President Trump until Friday had built up the American military presence in Germany, especially. Why? Because Putin is challenging European, uh, the independence and security of European countries, Ukraine, Georgia, but particularly our NATO allies. And we have obligations to them, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And so building up those forces is how we contain Russian power. It's a major mistake to withdraw 9,500 American troops. It's gonna be much more expensive financially than if we had kept them there. We actually would have to create room in bases, spend a lot of money to bring them back to the United States. And finally, I'd say, Dan, you know why he did this? He's angry at Angela Merkel. It's spite. And foreign policy by spite is not a smart thing to do. He doesn't like Chancellor Merkel. Uh, she has stood up to him, mainly privately, by the way. She is the greatest defender of democracy in the world today. She's not willing to go along with some of what he wanted to do. And so he's taken it out on her. And that is a very, very, very uh, poor decision on his part, in my, in my view. Next question is on the, um, the wealth gap. We were seeing the wealth gap grow massively leading up to the coronavirus hitting, and the virus has only widened it. As part of the return to balanced budgets, if we ever get there, do you see a wealth tax becoming likely, especially given that some polls show it has bipartisan support? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I mean, and really, truly, I'm just not smart enough. Uh, I'm not an economist. I'm not a, I'm not a domestic policy expert to know what the right decision is in terms of how, how can we address this massive problem of in, inequality? We've seen it laid bare uh, 
during coronavirus. You know, so many people lost their health insurance because they lost their job. I would think a big national movement of the future, and I hope both political parties would get, along, get behind it, would be to say that every citizen of the United States has the right to health care, and it's attached to your person. It's not attached to your employer. Uh, and that protects people in times like this. I also think it may, we may be on the verge of a new progressive era. We saw this in the 1890s, particularly in the Theodore Roosevelt presidency, the antitrust actions, Sherman Antitrust Act, breaking up big monopolies, uh, worker safety. We may be on the verge of something like that over the next 10 years that, that I think even Republicans uh, could get behind some of it, address it inequality. Um, when we were at BC, of course there was inequality in American society between the rich and poor, but the dimensions of it were nothing like we're dealing with now. When we were growing up, as little kids, you and I, in the 60s, as young teenagers in the 70s, there was, we had a progressive tax system. The wealthy, and my parents would describe themselves as middle class back then, we mainly paid a little bit more or a lot more than the poor did. And now we have a regressive tax system. And I think as an elementary standard of fairness to see so many corporations not paying significant amount of taxes, to see wealthy individuals and have the ability uh, to find tax shelters that poor people or even middle class people can't, to see it really difficult for middle class families to send their kids to Boston College or Harvard or UMass without substantial financial support uh, from outside, from the universities themselves. This is a true, I think it's probably America's greatest crisis along with the race crisis. So I think this is going to be addressed, and we've all got to put our best minds and hearts and souls to it. So we've got a few minutes left, and we wanted to end on uh, on something hopeful. And there's a whole host of topics we didn't cover. We didn't talk about North Korea. We didn't talk about Syria and, and the Middle Those East. Are hopeful. <laughs> Just you know, what would what couple of comments you'd want to end with? Well, if this is the last um, last question, Dan, I'd say this: there is hope in the world. Uh, I teach a course at Harvard called Great Powers, and we look at a lot of the issues we've talked about. How can Russia, China, the European Union, Nigeria, Indonesia, the United States, Great Brazil, how can we work together on big issues like climate change? How might we collide uh, in issues where we've talked about the big Chinese push for power in East Asia? At the end of the course, I always say to the students, okay, most of this course was about conflict and division. Can we think analytically about the positive global trend lines and how do we use uh, our efforts to push them forward to make life better, to make life more just and more peaceful? So I poll the students. And these are big classes of 50 to 75 students, depending on the year. They're multinational. This year I had 16 nationalities in my class. Last year I had 21 different nationalities. So you're getting a pretty good picture of what's happening and what young people are thinking about. And I asked them the following question online. Tell me what you're hopeful about. Don't tell me what you wish for, you know, world peace forever, which is unattainable probably. But analytically, put your analysis on mind on what's hopeful and where can you make the world better, your generation. Here's what they told me uh, last month. Poverty alleviation, more people lifted out of poverty in the last 40 years than at any other time in human history, well more than a billion people. That's been this incredible growth in the private sector. It's been private sector, the dynamism of the private sector business growth worldwide that has led, not government aid. That's number one. Number two, and this is ironic, still hopeful about global public health. Despite the pandemic, you know, we um, eradicated smallpox and several decades ago. We're just about as a global community to eradicate polio. Bill Gates thinks that malaria can be eradicated globally in his lifetime. And I think last year, around 500,000 kids below the age of five died from malaria in Africa alone. You could save all those lives, all those years going forward. Tremendous optimism that science, vaccination programs, World Health Organizations, if we can reform them, you know, can work to make the, the world um, safer people can live longer lives. And then just two more, the rise of women, not happening everywhere. Certainly Europe leading, 
but you, we see it in the United States. I mean, my, our three daughters have opportunities that my wife Libby didn't have when we graduated. She graduated the same year, different college in 1978. And um, we need to push that forward as a society, giving women their rightful place. And last, my students are hopeful about technology. Now, this is interesting because I tell them, I said, look, when you get older, you become a little risk averse. And I kind of see technology as a double-edged sword. Bill Gates does too. He says, look, she, Bill Gates wrote a great foreign affairs article two years ago where he said, very short, six pages. Anybody could just Google it and read it. Bill Gates, foreign affairs, spring 2018. He said, gene editing could actually lead to major increases in food production in countries that are water starved because we can alter the genetic um, basis of a blade of wheat. We can also alter the genetic structure of a cow to make that cow more productive in Tanzania, as productive, he says, as a cow in Scotland. He says, there's the promise. But then Bill Gates, really smart guy, says, here's the problem. What if we misuse gene editing ethically? What if some state decides to create you know, some advantage through gene editing that would be highly unethical for the rest of the world? So I tend to see technology, I see both halves, the promise and the peril. My students are younger. They're, they're of the tech generation. They kind of live and breathe it in the way that I kind of speak it as a foreign language. They speak it fluently. And they really think, they'll say things, and I love them for this, these young people. We can create a carbon-free world and yet have a growing global economy by 2050. Now, I don't know whether they can or not, but that ambition to use technology in an ethical way, and that's another Boston College issue. How can we, as men and women, be ethical in the way we act? Uh, they see that imperative. They see that with climate change and using technology for social and, and political improvement, not just for economic and technological improvement. So I like to, when I give talks around the country, I, or sit down with smart people like you, I think it's always good to end on hope because there is hope. As long as men and women are combining forces to try to improve the human condition and be successful, there's hope in the world. And so nice place for us to end this, this, this really good conversation. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank, thank you, Nick. It's, uh, it's terrific to end on that theme. Thank you for your generosity with your time today. Thank you for covering such a broad array of topics. Thank you for your continuous contributions to Boston College. And thank you to our audience for the great questions. Thank you, Dan. I felt we, 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 we covered so much territory. I felt I was on jeopardy. But you are <laughs> a great, you're a great interviewer. Let me just thank you for your contributions to Boston College, for your leadership over many years, I know, of the Finance Conference and and thank you and our great Dean, Andy Boynton, for what a great school the School of Management has become under the leadership of a lot of, of Andy and a lot of the alums. That's a great segue. I think Andy has some closing comments. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Dan. That was just fascinating. That was a great, a great conversation. Nick is a 1978 grad, along with myself from Boston College, and Dan was 1979. I'm sure you all agree that those are the best years of Boston College. And thank you all for joining us today. You can review this recording again, Nick's great presentation, bc.edu slash csom, C-S-O-M. It'll be on the website waiting for you. Remember this week, we have two more webinars on Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday is on contemporary retirement issues and Friday, is on global capital markets amidst this time of uncertainty. Join us on those days, please. Have a great week, be well, and be safe.